and just to clarify for those who have joined already, uh, Rian and I are going to be talking today about the protected area network and the extent of it, basically uh, from the northern boundary of the western province down to just before uh, Kurunagala town, so Kurunagala fall in the intermediate zone, uh, then via the Kitulgala Valley area, uh, past the southern boundary of the central highlands, uh, onto Singaraja, and then down to Tangle and back up to the Colombo area. So that is the southwestern region. It's mostly uh, lowland tropical rainforest and with a bit of sub-mountain forest towards the center. Yeah, yeah, we can show it on the map. I'll just point it out from yeah. somewhere and then, then yeah. down. That's a... yeah. uh, and then even in the Colombo metropolitan area, we have a couple of protected areas. Well, when I say a couple, I mean two specific ones, but uh, still better than nothing. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So, let's start us off by mentioning the fact of Singaraja falling into this zone, which is probably the most known area, like you mentioned just now, straight away, about Singaraja. And the fact that there's only one national park in this zone. In this you want to on that. It's, uh, it, it really shows the discrepancy between areas and who they fall under. And also, even in the case of Singaraja, many of you might not be aware of this, but the area that falls under eastern Singaraja is actually bounded by five proposed protected areas all around. So it does get a little complicated, but the basic idea is that Singaraja is not the only rainforest in this area. There are a lot more. All right. Also to mention the name of the national park for anyone who's interested, it's the Horogala National Park. Yeah. Uh, Horogala is technically our smallest national park, uh, but even in our smallest national park, you still get uh, all three species, the wild cat, barking deer, mouse deer, and a couple of other species as well. So it's not something that you just write off. Yes, it's not as impressive as Yala or Wilpapu, which I'm sure Rian will love to smile at, but uh, it is still very much a national park that contributes to the protected area network. Definitely, and that's why we started with the western province and the Saburgamo zone because it's closest to home for most of our viewers. It'll probably be Colombo, sure. and just to show that Colombo itself and that outer zones of Colombo also still has so much to offer. And in the metropolitan zone, we have two uh, protected areas, namely Atidia and the Kote protected zone. Yeah? So, and also. To, just to throw out there that there you still get jackal, fishing cat, pangolin, and all kinds of species that you would expect to see in bigger national parks. But however, they're found within Colombo. So it's a weekend trip for most of us. Exactly. Which is very interesting because the Colombo metropolitan area is our largest metropolitan area. There's 5 million people between the city and the suburbs. And despite that, um, if any of you are interested, Urban Fishing Cat uh, does a very, very informative project on the fishing cat populations in the Colombo metropolitan area, especially in the suburbs. And it's remarkable how many fishing cats they have actually come across. Um, but you can check out their Instagram page and their Facebook for more details on that. Definitely. That would be a very interesting follow, actually. And it's a really good project, especially because it's done within Colombo and people yeah. don't really know of what is happening in those small wetland zones in Colombo itself. Yeah. Also, uh, moving further downwards, you realize how scattered, one sec, let me just show this on the map itself. Compared to the east, how scattered this zone is. Exactly. And that's what we're trying to now create awareness that even though it, there doesn't seem to be much, there actually are lots of small, tiny little protected areas that are as important as probably this zone as well. So that is what we're going to be touching on today in this live. And what's interesting to keep in mind, just following on from what Rian said, these protected areas are actually viewed as inselbergs. They are sort of isolated fragments of pristine wilderness that still contain a, quite a varied diversity of species. So it's all well and good to say, you know, you need protected areas which are connected and they have to be large, maybe over, you know, 100 square kilometers. But the reality of the matter is that these protected areas, some of them are less than five square kilometers in size, but relative to what they have, they still contain quite a dense ecological diversity, which is something we still need, especially when we're talking about conservation in the wet zone, which I'm sure you would agree with. Exactly. And 
one of the biggest issues for Sri Lanka is the population density. Oh, yes. And yes. this is probably, like you mentioned earlier, the most populated zone in Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. And that is why there is this much, you know, this scattered effect of protected areas, because there are exactly. people living almost in the protected areas, basically. Exactly. I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like you said, you come across some of these protected areas closer to Colombo and even in and around Singaraj, and you just realize even surrounding the entire area, there are people absolutely everywhere. I mean, you can go to places in the dry zone even now where you don't find people for miles and miles. But in the wet zone, there is such a density of people. And that is something we have to balance in terms of uh, conservation for the wet zone. Yeah. No matter what, like you said, we have to balance it because the humans have to live somewhere. We can't just chase them out. Exactly. But, and unfortunately, the animals are the ones that get chased out. So by creating awareness and the imp- uh, promoting the importance of these even scattered protected areas, just the network it creates, the flora and fauna, like you said, even within those small, tiny, what, a few square kilometers across, there's still so much flora and fauna. Our country, the biodiversity across the island is, it rivals some of the biggest countries worldwide. Exactly. And just in this wet zone, like you said, being that scattered, it still has so much to offer. And that's why we are trying to promote the awareness and compare it even to the East Coast, even though it's this littered with protected areas, it is still home to so many species. That's what we're trying to now create this awareness, create this love for nature. Because we do, we both love uh, wildlife and flora and fauna. And that is one reason we decided to try and do this and just talk about what we think and what we propose and how yeah, how we would handle things like this and try and get yeah. other people to understand it. And not just that, there's actually quite an interesting security paradigm here as well. Um, I don't know if other viewers have tuned in, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but uh, uh, east of Homagama town, there is a protected area called Labugama Kalatua. And that is a national reserve forest that is actually responsible indirectly for the protection of the entire watershed when it comes to the reservoirs that give Colombo City its water supply. So in theory, even if you weren't somebody who was necessarily interested 100% in protecting biodiversity, if you wanted to think of it from one aspect, think of it as a water security paradigm. Because without this national reserved forest protecting the water supply for the Colombo metropolitan area, we would be in quite serious trouble when it comes to just having a basic water supply for a metropolitan area, which, again, holds 5 million people. So I think that's, it's important to realize that. Exactly, to touch on that a bit further, these protected areas, they create that safe haven for environment, biodiversity, flora, fauna. And like you said, it protects the water catchments and all different types of natural resources that would not be protected if development did occur in those zones. So even though this is one of the most developed zones, like you said, it's protecting our own water catchment, which is very important. And another reason that you would protect it, even if you're not in coming into it from a nature point of view. Exactly. You have to think about all aspects. All right. And now just to touch on, I think the most important for the viewers would be the Colombo zone, because that is so close to home. We spoke about Atidia and Kote. So just to go deeper and give them an explanation on those two areas as well. Yeah. What would you say is the importance of those two within the Colombo metropolitan zone? Yeah, so when it comes down to it, um, there are historic, historical records which basically confirm the fact that within the historical Colombo metropolitan area, before the metropolitan area actually officially came into existence, there are confirmed reports that we even had leopards in certain parts of what would be considered the suburbs of Colombo now. So in that sense, from a biodiversity preservation standpoint, these protected areas are critical. And I know there's a lot of interference, obviously, because they are wildlife sanctuaries. And being tier four protected areas, lower tier four like wildlife sanctuaries means In one sense, there is a lot of interference from other government entities, such as district secretariats, divisional secretariats, the Sri Lanka Land Reclamation and Development Corporation, etc. But still, it is there to ensure that the biodiversity that keeps Colombo somewhat alive in an ecological sense is there. And also at the same time, it actually provides us with a cooling factor as well, 
because the Colombo metropolitan area has seen heat waves and average heat, which has jumped, you know, 30, 40% in the last five to six years. And if we wipe out those remaining protected areas completely, we lose an ecological component and we lose a cooling component as well. So at least from my perspective, that would be what I would focus on. Oh, I think in a lot of people's perspective, it's just that lots of people wouldn't really realize that. There's all those knock-on effects that are happening. When we destroy one thing, it's a web because ecosystems are all connected web and it just just hits everything. Just the smallest act could just destroy countless other things that are happening for us. Like you said, the cooling factor. We heard stories. I don't think either of us were around, but we heard when Thursday <laughs> was what Colombo looked like. Yeah? yeah. So imagine those type of trees all around Colombo. And uh, for me, that is, that's a special and also sad that now you don't see that other than down Bulazutan, which is the best example. And, so, and you hear all these stories from some of the most senior wildlife conservationists about all these fantastic endemic birds that used to visit Colombo. And you just think now how devoid Colombo is in comparison to what it could have once been. And it is a little sad in one sense, but, you know, with the march of development, but, I guess. That, that's exactly. But also, again, those birds still do visit some of these small protected areas. So exactly. it's important how even those small, minute details provide so much. The life that it provides for these, because for us, we tend to be able to live everywhere. But again, like you said, the knock-on effects, water catchment protector, the cooling system for us, and trees do provide us with oxygen after all. So, and also, yeah, I would also just, you know, point out for those who may live in the suburban areas, every so often just keep an eye out, you know, at night go out with a torch and just have a look around. Very occasionally you will see either a fishing cat or a porcupine. I've got so many images before from people who have lived in the suburbs and who have just been shining their torches out and going for a walk at night. And all this wildlife, this urban wildlife that Rihanna and I have been mentioning, still walking around the suburbs today. I think that is fantastic. Oh, not, not even in the suburbs. I've heard reports even within Colombo. In the city itself, yeah. Even golden jackal, which you wouldn't think would want. <laughs> Fishing cat is understandable because they found a way to stay away during the daytime and become extremely nocturnal. But golden jackal walking around, I mean, some people would think it's a dog, so no one notices. But yeah. that, for me, is fascinating that they found a way to adapt. And especially one of my favorite creatures, the crocodile, they've found a way to survive wherever they want. Yeah, exactly. I used to drive to school and drive past the Arthidia the lake that they have there and there was a resident crocodile no one seemed to notice it things like that they managed to survive despite the damages that we are causing so through this we're trying to promote we give them some sort of protection yeah, yeah that's what it's it's remarkable and, and just adding on to your point the stories i've heard about these crocodiles and half the time they end up being saltwater crocodiles we're talking about the largest living reptile on the planet is living in the vicinity of the Colombo metropolitan and area. Amazing, Crocodiles they can just forest. disappear and become hidden, yeah? Exactly. I, mean, I find it fascinating. Yeah. It's, uh, but it's, it's also interesting because it really shows you how a lot of the ecosystems within these urban protected areas are very much wetland ecosystems. And they are ecosystems that very few people actually appreciate the importance of and mostly take for granted. So it all ties in nicely going back to the fact that we need to preserve these urban protected areas, very much so. I think that would be the base of this because we're talking about one of the main areas where human beings are living at the moment in Sri Lanka, one of the highly populated zones, and the importance of not disrupting their web as such. Yeah? Exactly. So that is why we started with this area. It's basically close to most of the viewers' homes and our homes. And it is what you would think doesn't have as much, but it ends up, I think we have it here, there's 122 protected areas and 44 proposed areas, yes. which is massive. That's 165, yeah? Yeah, 165 protected areas. Five, yeah. Yeah. Which, when you look at a map like this, most people wouldn't realize. So through things like this, and maybe now someone can go and convey that fact to someone else, and like that, create that awareness. And not just that, you know, everybody who is interested in wildlife to a degree, should actually take the time, you know, even to travel to places such as Singaraja, Diyadava, Kannelia, Ramalakam. These places aren't that far. It's not like traveling to Yala or traveling yeah, to exactly. 
You can get That's what I was saying. But this is a weekend know. trip. This is a weekend trip. We are in Wilpato also probably weekend. But yeah. this you can do in a day. Exactly. Just and drive down there in the morning, spend your morning there and maybe drive back in the afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. Just visit. And the ones within Colombo are uh, just even in the evening you can go for a walk around. Exactly. So and also so much keep in mind, you know, we are, we are talking about, you know, the most populated region of the country, but I think it's important that we, you know, just clarify that even in Singaraj and the periphery protected areas, there are two remaining rainforest elements left. One of which happens to be a tusker, a short tusk tusker, and the fact that Singaraj potentially holds the last real bank for black leopards on the island. So, you know, these protected areas might not necessarily be as big as their dry zone counterparts, but I will be personally damned if I say that they are not as diverse because they are a hundred times more diverse than their bigger counterparts in the dry zone. It is really oh, well. Singaraj is a hotspot, especially for birders, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. birders, reptiles, all kinds of things. Like you said, black leopards, which was put forward by the Department of Wildlife this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. generally. Yeah. Yeah. Went, everyone went crazy about for a moment and now seems to have forgotten, which I think is a good thing. Well, there's, uh, there's two sides. <laughs> also, just now that you mentioned Singaraj, also to mention the other rainforest within this. Some people know Singaraja as the rainforest in Sri Lanka. Yeah, but there are also these others. And just to touch on that, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, so it's interesting that everybody only knows Singaraja. There are a few people I know who might say, if you say the net term Carnelia, they might know it. But what most people wouldn't realize about Carnelia, it's actually part of a larger cluster of protected areas, which includes Carnelia, Dediagla, and Nakia then as protected areas. And that region alone has been identified as floristically South Asia's richest region in terms of plant life, which is again amazing. And then aside from that, you have protected areas such as the Diadawa Conservation Forest, you have the Ramalakam, the National Reserve Forest, you have the two Berylia proposed reserves, which contain mostly secondary rainforest, but still with quite a diversity. And then there's one that a few bird lovers might know, which is Yagivilla, which is also quite a well-known protected area uh, in terms of uh, birding and just general, uh, the general desire to see you know, small examples of wildlife such as mammal small mammalian, reptilian, and amphibian fauna. And even to end on it, Morapitya Runakanda. Runakanda has always been known as a proposed reserve. But uh, I can tell you now that there are certain elements in civilian society who are doing some incredible herpetology-related research in the Morapitya area. So many endemic snakes, so many endemic species of frogs. It is absolutely remarkable. And that all ties back into what we were saying about just how diverse despite the fragmentation, these rainforest protected areas really are. Exactly. And then also things, I'm trying to touch on things that people would see in the everyday journey. On the way to the airport, you drive through another proposed protected area, where the mm. highway was, unfortunately. Yeah. But, and then Bolgo, the places like that. It's all around us. And it's just, people probably don't know. And also there's a lot of things that shouldn't be happening going on within those areas. Unfortunately, however, by creating what we're talking about today and into further live stream, just mentioning some of these things people might not have known and then going and telling others, that's probably one of the keys for Sri Lankan biodiversity. Because in the end, our biodiversity is going to depend on our conservationists or nature lovers because of the fact that Sri Lanka is so vastly populated. And there is going to be the human-animal conflicts that arise. However, again, it comes down to us and what we can do for it. Yeah. And like you were talking about Singaraja, there are all those proposed areas for Singaraja that yeah. if they come into effect, would be so much better for Singaraja itself because yeah. we know the destruction that is happening around Singaraja. And it's probably worse than Vilpatu and all of that that people yeah. do know about. Exactly. You won't, you won't that, touch. Not just that. I mean, just start adding on to that point exactly. Fun fact that if those proposed protected areas, and there's 22 that's around Singaraja, were actually incorporated into the reserve, and there's actually a plan in motion to make that happen, that would quadruple the size of Singaraja. Can you imagine how fantastic that would be to have four times the area in Singaraja to explore and really appreciate with some biodiversity? It's something that very few people take into account. Just like even in the Colombo metropolitan area, Talangama, which is a wetland, and it's a CEA protected area. It would be officially the Talangama Environmental Protection Area, 
the third big protected area within the metropolitan area that contains some stunning bird life even today. So, you know, going back again to Singaraja and the adjacent protected areas, for example, if we were to be successful enough to reintroduce two female wild elephants into the Singaraja National Forest Reserve and periphery areas, we could actually potentially rehabilitate the entire wild elephant population in the lowland wet zone. So you really have to well, think of this. Now that, now that yeah. you did mention that, Again, it comes down to how we deal with it, yeah? Because exactly, yeah. in the end, the biggest threat to elephants are us. And unfortunately, unfortunately we, uh, this deforestation and, well, shooting and killing due to human-elephant conflict is how lots of these animals have died out. So again, even if this reintroduction does happen, it yeah. comes down to us and how we deal with it and how we can help protect them into the future and if it is successful again it comes down to us how we can help that that i think would be the key of what we are trying to promote here in the end it is us and only us because it's our future it's our country and it has so much to offer i would say our wildlife and biodiversity like i did say earlier is second to none and it is one of the biggest tourist attractions after the cultural yeah, culture and, and wildlife would be two of the big reasons to, the, to come down. And the beaches. And the beaches, of course. And that's also funny, because, but also at the same time, it is important that people understand that these protected areas don't all fall under one entity. I know personally myself, I've been asked multiple times who these protected areas actually fall under. And I know it can get a little bit amusing when you, know, you realize who actually knows about what. But the reality, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter remains. Now, as you said earlier, with regard to, you know, um, what attracts tourists to Sri Lanka. It's the national parks. But yet, you, when you come to this area, you only have one small national park. So then you have to ask yourself, where do you go instead? And the reality of the matter is, 90% of the network between the Colombo metropolitan area and going all the way down by the southern boundary of the central highlands down to Tangle and back up, actually falls under the Department of Forest Conservation, or DFC. Then you have... I think that's one thing we didn't mention here. Yeah, DFC yeah, exactly. has most control in this area. I yeah, think, what did you say? 95%, yeah? Yeah, 95, 90 to 95%. And then the balance falls under 11 wildlife sanctuaries, one national park, and uh, three CEA environmental protection areas. So the Department of Forest Conservation really has incredible control of this area. You know, it's unrivaled. And, and it's, not, it's not the same everywhere, but definitely for this area. This is very much the Department of Forest Conservation oriented area. All right, there's a comment in there about talking about wildlife outside the protected area. Well, the wildlife has found a, well, it's their safe haven, the protected areas, and they use it because they feel safer there. I mean, I would yeah. feel safer in my home, so I'd stick to my home. But exactly. they do move across. So what really does happen is most animals, they find gardens, just somewhere where they can feel safe and they need that sense of protection is when you see wildlife outside these protected areas, they move through, like you said, in our first live stream how an elephant could move across from one side all the way up to the northern sections of the country. So it's times like that when you see the bigger mammalian fauna moving across. Mm -hmm. However, birds and all of that would be found in home gardens across Sri Lanka because they just need those trees, nesting zones, peaks, like some place to roost for the night. So you do get a lot of flora and fauna outside the parks. But I would say lots of it happens within the park just because of that level of protection and safety that they feel. If yeah, that absolutely. your question. Yeah, or, so right. just, to, just to elaborate on what Lakita was asking, I mean, you know, it, it's funny that even for the new Singaraja Gazette, in which they said they were going to encompass all these protected areas under one Gazette and quadruple Singaraja's size, one of the statements that was actually made by one of the assistant conservative generals of the Department of Forest Conservation was that they need to develop a comprehensive management plan that actually includes the use of home gardens as biological corridors, which is interesting because it means, you know, aside from the fact that the two Singaraja elephants and occasionally leopards travel between Singaraja and these satellite protected areas outside the network, usually through tea fields or village areas, these biological corridors that could be created for small examples of fauna, mammalian, reptilian, amphibian, insect, avoid, etc., are critical in ensuring that there is actually biological movement because otherwise you get biological stagnation and that is a disaster itself. Just, just to jump in there, 
that's what we were talking about how scattered it is and they, yeah. that obviously needs that connection so they do have to move through because it's so scattered and they're so so small these protected areas so that's why especially on this western zone and sabargamo areas they do move across but they have found a way to become very no especially the bigger fauna whereas Actually. birds and reptiles and all we move through at any time of day but mm-hmm. lots of the larger fauna has become very nocturnal in these zones is what i have found. we'll talk about it more when we talk about the central highlands because i did do some work there and exactly. just we'll touch on that further in the live streams to come so. but uh, but again you know it keep it makes a valid point in that sense as to one potential solution for the wet zone supposing we can't actually get the land needed to create new protected areas to link the existing ones is to actually use home gardens and ecological gardens yeah definitely and that would give people further incentive to reforest and look after their own gardens to appreciate biodiversity you know it has to be very comprehensive how you look at it and that is important just to mention for everybody who's watching because then you get a further idea of how we can look at alternative solutions to biodiversity conservation which i'm sure you can agree with exactly and especially now during this lockdown period you're seeing all these pictures of animals moving across more because i i would say it's not that they weren't doing it before i mean probably the bigger fauna yes but like birds and reptiles people are now at their house and they're seeing it happen that's the exactly. difference here that's what i think i don't think they're just moving around suddenly because we are away they actually moving around but we just don't take the time to notice it exactly i have seen so much outside from my balcony i just stand out there and i've taken so many great photographs of bird life that just come and just sit on the tree outside and it's amazing what we have to offer and like you said it's those home gardens are really important because they do provide that especially for birds my and we do get a lot of migratory birds so them coming in and then hanging around and then moving on so that protection is what they find key which is which is even more viable when you think of the fact that these biological corridors as it were which are created by the pe- the fact that people are actually building these home gardens actually means that when migrants come to sri lanka they find a place to rest relax recuperate eat something and then carry on and then that keeps the natural flow of ecological movement going that's just to take it all apart i've i've also heard stories and uh, even my home garden we have a paradise like it uh, that came and they liked it and they ended up staying there so you get some type of migratory birds that if they find the place that they do end up coming back again and again and that creates in its own a uh, type of well protected area you, your garden can be your protected area exactly exactly and then and then you 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 determine based on how much work you put in and how how much effort you need how many species are going to utilize your home garden as an informal protected area before they carry on their journey elsewhere exactly unfortunately it's the larger fauna that have problems moving through due to the scattered nature and the population density within these areas and that's where the human conflict does come but we'll touch on that after we talk about the different protected areas but if there are any questions people can ask them and i think that's about wrapping it up unless you want to talk about yeah so just the final point i wanted to mention just before we wrap up today's half an hour session is the fact that you know when as you mentioned the larger fauna protected areas are very much an integral part of biodiversity conservation and i just want everybody to keep in mind for singaraja i know everybody goes to singaraja and sees the lowland tropical rainforests of western singaraja but actually when you think about it it's eastern singaraja in the sub mountains zone you know the sub mountains zone is probably one of the most fragmented areas in the country and between the walangkan the mountain range uh, directly north of eastern singaraja as well as eastern singaraja itself that southern portion of the sub mountains zone contains an incredible amount of biodiversity yet the sad part is that a lot of those protected areas as we mentioned earlier are still in proposed status you know you have surya kanda handapanala gongala silver kanda and morning side as well those protected areas are beyond incredible and you know black leopards rainforest elephants an incredible amount of avian diversity so i think it's important that we do our best where we can to lobby the department of forest conservation because as we said earlier 95% of this network is theirs so if we can just let's try our best to lobby the department of forest conservation to get these protected areas the protection they need and then i think we are one step closer yeah and that's why i would say again that awareness is coming to it like we will talk about this but if we can get it out there to the larger audience and exactly. try and get them to understand it as well we get more backing and we can take it to the forest department and the wildlife department 
and with yeah. that extra backing we can get these proposals pushed through so exactly. that is i think another key aspect because in the end we're doing it for our own good and our own country mm-hmm. and because we love our country that's what i would finish on because yeah. that's the reason i i would say i'm doing this not i i have had the chance to i would say enjoy this and i've worked in lots of these protected areas but for the future that's what sri lanka is one of those places that has so much to offer and it is our duty to protect it absolutely and you know i'm the same i've had the privilege of growing up in a lot of these protected areas from the time i was a kid and i've come to realize after working here that in sri lanka the government entities the state entities that own these protected areas are the ones who we have to work with there is no example yeah. of private protected areas in sri lanka so if i was going to leave on one thing i would say let's use this opportunity to reorient our priorities and try and get a little bit more out of biodiversity conservation and i think that's the yeah. one thing that could potentially yeah. I would say yeah so also to touch on next week's topic it would be yeah. eastern zone so that would be to some of our people's favorite place yala oh, yes. and yes, yes. we will be touching on the protected areas within that and there we'll talk about how the buffer zones and the corridors come into effect and the importance of so hopefully most of you will join us next week and i will see you next week as well absolutely sounds right. good Take care. Yeah.